Today, we've teamed up with building material company Wholesome uh, to talk about Striatus. Uh, Striatus is a 3D printed concrete footbridge uh, by Block Research Group at ETH Zurich and Zaha Hadid Architects Computation and Design Group in collaboration with concrete 3D printing specialist Incremental 3D. The project was made possible by, possible by Wholesome, uh, which created a special concrete ink which was used to print the bridge. To explain all about the project, uh, I'm joined by Philippe Block, founder of Block Research Group at ETH. Hi, Philippe. Hi, Ben. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm excited to share what we have done with Striatus. Um, I guess I'll, I have to introduce myself briefly. Not yet, not yet. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll get you to do that in just a second. Um, we've also got um, uh, Shajai Bhushan, who's founder of Computation and Design Group at Zaha Hadid. Hi, Shajai. Hey, Ben. Thanks for the invitation. No worries. Uh, and we've also got uh, Nolig Forrest, um, who is Head of Communications and Public Affairs at Wholesome. Hi, Nolig. Hi, Ben. Great to be with you today. Good to be with you as well. Um, okay, great. Um, Philippe, um, you can now introduce yourself. So yeah, tell us a little bit about what you do at Block Research Group. Yeah, apologies. Uh, so I'm both an architect and a structural uh, engineer. So uh, a hybrid, call me an architectural engineer or a structural designer. And that is also kind of the spirit of our group that we combine both fields to uh, try to provide solutions that uh, that have a very clear kind of environmental target. We are trying to reduce embodied emissions. We are trying to reduce waste and we are trying to reduce resource uh, use. And so as a structural designer, you have a lot of influence on this. Great. Uh, and uh, Shadjay, what about your role at, um, at Zaha? Yeah, so I co-founded the Computation and Design Group, which is a practice-based research group. So we sit uh, between like uh, groups, uh, fundamental research groups like Philippe's groups in uh, in ETH and and the the designers in the company. So so we try to be the conduit. Um, and Striatus is a is one typical ex is is a example of how we try to achieve that. Crap. Uh, and Nolik, what do you do at Wholesome? So I'm Nalik Forrest, Group Head of Communications at Wholesome, and we are the largest building materials company worldwide. Um, our vision is to lead the way in innovative and sustainable building solutions. And that's why it was an evidence for us to join the Striatus adventure, uh, because it really represents everything that our vision stands for. It's digital, it's environmentally advanced, and it is circular by design. That's why we're really proud partners um, of the Striatus project. Great, perfect. Okay, so Philippe, I think you're going to um, kick us off to kind of explain a bit more about this about this project. Um, if you want to go ahead and uh, share your screen, um, and then yeah, tell us all about it.
right, so uh, that was a quick intro, a summary video, uh, already outlining some of the key concepts of striatus. But um, I'll, I'll maybe reinforce a little bit where this project came from or what, what the fundamental principles were that we wanted to demonstrate here. Um, in, important for me to start is that uh, we are actually uh, learning from the past, uh, um, bringing strength through geometry rather than an accumulation of materials. And uh, specifically these beautiful vaulted uh, geometries from the Gothic for masonry structures are highly appropriate because one way to look at um, unreinforced concrete is actually to, in a very simplistic way, you could say that this is an artificial sandstone and a stone is happy in compression. Uh, stones uh, or brick want to follow uh, basically the arch. And indeed, uh, this is a key message that we want to demonstrate with striatus is that uh, rather than forcing a material in a shape that it doesn't want to be, like a beam in bending on the left, we introduced a tight arch. And if you were to do this, for example, for a beam or a floor plate, then you would uh, have really significant uh, reductions in material needed. So we wanted to scale this up at a structure that really is structural so that people fully appreciate the concept. And so uh, this is a very early sketch indeed showing how striatus is basically like a historic masonry bridge, but then of course with a twist where we are looking into what 3D printing can add to this. So rather than, uh, uh, this is another masonry structure that we've done in the past, the Armadillo Vault in 2016, but rather than cutting stone or actually casting elements uh, to have a masonry uh, structure, which both are expensive and wasteful processes, uh, indeed with 3D printing, we can now place the material uh, exactly where it's needed. And we do this not only um, on the element size, so maybe something that you can already appreciate is that the print layers are not parallel so that they can be nicely orthogonal to the main force flow on every point. But on the left, you also see the section of these blocks are really optimized to be able to work as masonry. So through that, we um, achieve many different things that we find important and that the masonry uh, model allows is we reduce the amount of materials that we uh, need by placing it only where the forces want to flow in compression. Uh, you saw that we also do this in the section, but we also actually reduce the stresses in the material, which opens the path to developing very low strength and hence low carbon footprint materials in the future indeed. Repair, particularly for uh, infrastructure, is quite relevant, uh, certainly in reinforced concrete. We have a clean separation of materials, so that gives us, so that gives us a very clear kind of outlook uh, for maintenance. Because, the, again, the masonry benefit is that the structure is dry assembled, so you could really take it apart and install it somewhere else, so we have a reuse scenario. And again, because of this clean separation and not having to reinforce or add materials to the unreinforced concrete, we can also have a very easy recycling. So in, in a way, what we did is globally, the bridge works like a cut stone masonry bridge, like a historic bridge. But on the element level, it's also masonry, like a Nubian vault, or like you say here, a more brick-like kind of uh, a structure. So masonry on two levels allows concrete really to shine, to be placed only where needed, uh, reversible end, end, end. And we're very proud, of course, of this uh, beautiful result that really shows um, a, a design process where uh, all these constraints were taken from the beginning uh, through an extremely beautiful collaboration. Great. Thanks, Philippe. Um, uh, great, great project. Um, how long does it, did it take to, to, to build or how, how long did it take to develop the design and then to print it and then to construct it on site? That's a fantastic question because uh, we challenge things in, 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 on different levels. So uh, the design, uh, but when we, when we talk about design, it's design, it's prototyping, it's engineering, it's development all together. So all of that went over a span of, I think, uh, just over three months. Um, the printing itself, uh, remarkably, uh, the total print time was only 84 hours, uh, which, uh, which is uh, quite spectacular. 
And uh, this is, by the way, for all the blocks, right? So the entire structure was prefabricated in 84 hours. And yeah, then assembly, if we would not have hit so many challenges with local authorities in, in Venice, then uh, it would have gone very smoothly. But so let's say that we were three weeks on site uh, uh, on average. And um, you, um, you talked about like the inspiration of, of going back to Gothic architecture or like the Nubian, Nubian vault. Um, I suppose the obvious question is, why not just use those um, those old technologies which have been you know tried and tested for, for years? What what does something like Striatus bring that's new? What what advantages does it have over those old techniques? Yeah, so uh, I mean, there's different aspects. One I already highlighted that these these historic techniques were done in different ages where labor was not an issue, for example, and and so uh, addressing the fabrication in a uh, these custom geometries, these bespoke geometries that we can realize them uh, uh, without excess uh, waste through subtractive, uh, uh, subtractive methods, so cutting away or casting uh, with using molds and things like that. So 3D printing really gave us the opportunity to optimize that aspect. And again, as, as, as I've shown also on the sectional side. But then also for me, not unimportant is... Um, uh, we have these material, uh, these modern materials, showing these, the relevance of these principles with modern materials is for me a key aspect. And then particularly, actually, uh, if you look at concrete as a material is, is quite low, low embodied emissions. And uh, this is looking at standard concretes. This is not even looking at all the developments in much, much greener concretes. Like actually, to be honest, absolutely holds him is taking the lead on developing those at scale and applicable. But so for me, maybe a key bottleneck is, is how these materials are being used in excess because materials are, 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 are cheap and so on. So what we show here in Striatus that if we actually use concrete, how it wants to be used like, like an arch, that, that um, and I could elaborate on this with some other examples, but then it will be very hard to beat this material. And it, it has to do with actually understanding how this material wants to, wants to behave. And there's other kind of aspects like we have forgotten about these beautiful arches, maybe also because formally we don't like them because they were too expensive to make, but we are currently exactly at the point that, um, uh, um, uh, additive manufacturing, uh, digital fabrication is really scaling up and is really becoming so robust that it can be used again at real, at real scale, at meaningful scales and applications. And exactly for because of that moment that we now can reintroduce complexity and not for the sake of aesthetics, but for the sake of good structural form that really disrupt how we have built before. I showed you 70% less concrete and 90% less steel, that is disruptive, right? So reintroducing these things now are feasible because we have the computational engineering methods, we have the integrated design approaches, and we now also can fabricate these elements at economical and very non-wasteful kind of ways. So that's, that for me is different compared to just rebuilding uh, classic right so we're not we're not necessarily only adoring the brick structures and the stone structures of the past but we are demonstrating the value of the principles behind it for modern uh, uh, at scale construction uh, those are some of the things we wanted to show in striatus great Lovely. Okay, um, Shaja, you're up next. I think you're going to talk to us a little bit about the uh, kind of computational design side of, of the project. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, for this section, um, like it probably is worth mentioning that uh, uh, I'm also a PhD uh, candidate working with uh, Philippe in, in Block Research Group, and it's my own PhD is one of many PhDs that contributed to Striatus. Um, and so we believe that like these digital processes and an integrated design to construction kind of uh, methodology or approach is very critical to achieve like the goals that like Philippe just mentioned, like, you know, in terms of redu reduction, in terms of recycling, et cetera. And at the same time, achieve a kind of new language for concrete, which is which is one of the most enduring and widely used materials, as Philip mentioned. And so we wanted it to be not 
it uh, not cast and solid, but striated, lightweight, mold free, and kind of high performance in this kind of uh, low, um, you know, minimized wastage kind of way. Um, so, like we also along the way discovered that like um, Striatus also demonstrates or the workflows demonstrate a possible schema or a blueprint uh, for a imminent future, which is digitally designed, robotically manufactured and agile constructions. Um, and, and also unlike what most people believe, like uh, 3D printing and digital design is not like only automation focus, it's actually um, very much a synergy between uh, humans and machines. And more importantly, it allows for a reinjection of intelligence and productivity enhancement in, uh, into the architecture engineering construction industry. So, um, so we, we tried set out to uh, integrate across the various uh, disciplines like design, engineering, fabrication, and construction from the get-go, unlike what is typical uh, to 20th century design and production is, is, is that like the, these operate in silos and in sequence, we wanted it to be co-authored really, um, because that's how we believe uh, the goals could be achieved. And, and to that end, like we also had to challenge existing CAD and so-called building information modeling tool sets, because those are not particularly aligned with digital design nor robotic production. Uh, so we had to come up with a kind of task specific and effective way to collaborate and we, we built our own software to do that. Um, and most of the uh, heavy lifting was done by the open source and collaborative framework that is uh, developed again by Block Research Group and made available to the wider community. And more importantly, all the learnings um, from Striatus will be re assimilated into Compass and again, will be available to, to the wider audience. So um, in comparison, as I said, to see in traditional CAD processes and BIM processes, like we set out to be both design friendly, but at the same time also process and production aware um, so that we are developing very streamlined processes from design to construction. And so on the one hand, we. We want it to be amenable to, to designers and it's uh, friendly and easy to manipulate, but at the same time, we are aware of what the robot needs and how the construction processes, what the information is needed there. And so we start like uh, from very simple, easy to manipulate points and lines. And along the way, like we can create all of the information needed to 3D print them and, and also to construct the support structures, et cetera. And uh, important thing to point out here that it is not all just automated, it is human guided and it is steered by very many number of uh, wide, uh, expert, experts in, in their own domains. Um, so it's, it's not just like click a button kind of automation, it's more uh, collaborative in that sense between humans and machines. So just to give you a um, kind of summary of that, like it, we start with a simple center line outline of the plan of the, of the bridge, uh, again, represented by a set of points and lines. Um, and as you can see, like with every increasing operation, like the, the custom file format, like grows a little bit, but at the same time, it is very much very precise in the sense that it was only containing the information needed for this particular uh, type of design and construction. Um, and it's also uh, very much uh, friendly to collaborate, like so we can ex exchange information at distance um, over the internet, et cetera. So it's, it's um, and here we are also finding, incorporating some of like the previous um, advances showed in, in uh, Armadillo, for example, like Mason reconstruction, uh, and computational masonry. Um, and subsequently, we also decompose uh, the global shape, as Philip mentioned, into blocks, um, and it's because it's the masonry construction requires them to be blocks. Um, and, and we also test them under various loading conditions, um, like moving the support. And in this particular instance, like, like th uh, up to three hippos standing on that particular point, like so. So very, it has been subjected to all, all forms of digital evaluation and loading conditions, et cetera. And you can also notice that like all of this information is stored and ready for inspection for whoever needs to uh, consume that information. Um, and lastly, we also 
create like from all of this information of the structural evaluation, like we also then create the printing paths uh, that the robots need. And so it's informed by this masonry analysis and design principles at the, at the scale of the block. And, and then we also check whether it can be printed along the inclined plane. Um, with, with uh, holes in special ink and and the expertise of incremental 3D. And then we repeat this over the 53 blocks um, and, and then kind of assemble them on site. And um, so that's that's broadly speaking, like how like the digital process enables the 3D printing of concrete and assembly subsequently. And it also incorporates some of these aspects upfront in, in the design uh, phase and and um, so we'll also briefly mention a little bit about the 3D printing itself, which is again small expert teams, uh, which is a feature of digital design and fabrication. Um, is is not only technological and there's a lot of engineering involved, but but there's definitely a craft aspect and a, and a human expertise aspect and also capacity to collaborate digitally. Uh, yeah, remotely even. So that um, so this kind of process extends all the way to the printing and knowing what the robot needs. Uh, and you can see like the file only contains precisely what the robot exactly needs. And, and we are able to also uh, simulate ahead of time like what, what might be the features that you may encounter when, when you finish printing. And why go through all these uh, effort? Um, and precisely to be able to um, locate material exactly where it's needed, but at the same time also take advantage of some of the natural expressive character of, of the process and so on the production process. So, for example, these grooves are not artificially in, or arbitrarily inserted design features. They come because uh, the robot stops there and turns. And so we just aligned uh, the start and stop points on every layer, such that like the groove is continuous. So, so we we express a natural consequence of, of a production process, and same is true for all the striated uh, layers and the inc inclined paths and, and so on. And so, um, so uh, yeah, so the so these this is a glimpse into the kind of intelligence that is kind of re-injected into every step of the process and 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 that it's also very small teams working in 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 tandem and like not in uh, separation not one after another but like truly co-authored collaborative workflows so yeah maybe i'll stop here and great great thank you Sajay. um and um you said that you're working on very small teams. What was the size of the team working on this project across the different, how many people did it take to, to, to build this bridge? Yeah, so um, for a block research group, like, um, like because I had the dual role, so I will count myself twice. <laughs> uh, so more, maybe four to six people, like, uh, and then likewise in every of the team, like, um, uh, across like incremental 3D holds in material engineering and also the construction crew. Uh, if you notice in the video is uh, Virgin Creations, they're also very small, but very agile. Um, and the machines themselves were very small uh, lifts, forklifts, uh, spider lift, etc. So maybe all together, like across six months, maybe like, you know, 20 people. Um, and se yeah. several of them are or almost all of them like, you know, uh, with a wide expertise and experience in, in the field. Yeah. And you talked a little bit about it being a kind of marriage between human and, and, and machine, you know, like how much of it do you think is machine versus, versus human? When you look at the finished um, structure, can you kind of, can you see the human hand and uh, as well as the kind of the robotic arm, you know, the print of the robotic arm, where does the kind of ratio lie? Yeah, I mean, more than the human hand per se, like, yeah, like there's like a lot of this tacit information and human intelligence that like, you know, accrued wisdom in the mason reconstruction, which, which is now uh, increasingly um, made available through computational tools. And, and uh, so there's that aspect. And, 
Um, so, and then there's also the crafting aspect, like each of these processes, like the sub steps that I showed, like it's not just click a button, like there are very many parameters that like you kind of uh, oversee and steer, right? So it's like more a steering exercise for the humans rather than like literally drawing every line. Like, so those are automated, but like, you know, amongst choosing from very many different parameters that like may affect the outcome and whether it's structural, whether it's fabrication, whether it's like all the layers that like need could be expressed and, and also like seeking these opportunities, like how to express the printing process or how to express the force flow and the masonry logic. And so it's, it's uh, in that sense, a more, um, yes, a, a kind of orchestra between uh, humans and, and machines. Right? And, and you, the bridge kind of clearly kind of celebrates uh, its origins. It's, it's not trying to pretend not to be, to be 3D printed. But in terms of the way it looks, how much of that is determined by, by the, the, the computation? And how much is that um, human saying, we want it to look this way. We want it to have this kind of impact as a, as a visual structure. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And here, like I will again, uh, kind of highlight like Philippe's own PhD from like uh, more than a decade ago. Like, so these tools like the strength through geometry is basically like, you know, very il illuminating on the, how the structural processes could, could be leveraged and or could be expressed. Like, so it's not just one solution, like it opens up a entire space of solutions, right? Like, and it's also very didactic because it's visual, first of all, geometry is easier to understand than numerical calculations. And, and it's also collaborative in that sense. So um, yeah, so there is, there is that aspect of knowing what to do with, or how to interpret that information. Um, and, and so, um, and sim similarly with like all the robotic uh, or process parameters, such as like the layers themselves, like we could have chosen to erase them or spray them over, like, but we chose to, celebrate that including all the uh, slight anomalies here and there because it so none, none of that is actually truly random because it's all part of the process right like so it's so we um so that's one of the, the really nuanced aspect of, of digital design and construction and robotic manufacturing that really truly re-injects the the kind of designer play role across the spectrum it's not just um, designers doing one thing and then somebody else figuring out how to build stuff like so so, so yeah that, that was very enjoyable for us as well to to like really absorb all the expertise from across the spectrum so if you'd wanted to you could have created a something that visually looks very traditional like a, a kind of standard um, um kind of stone or concrete um structure yeah, no, definitely. Like, but that wasn't the point. And it, it's also reflected in the name, like striatus is like to try and express the layers of, of not only layers of concrete printing, but also then the masonry blocks and then also the many layers of information that is coordinated. Yeah. yeah. And just one more question before we move on to, to knowledge. Um, is there anything in particular in terms of like technology that's made this possible? I mean, you mentioned that you you had to write your own software to, 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 to work on the project because there wasn't something that you could use. Um, is, is that kind of testament to the kind of work that people in the open source community are doing to enable that, to make that possible? What's kind of happened in the last few years that, that makes a project like this possible? I think it's testament, yeah, definitely to, to the maturing industry of like computational design engineering and digital fabrication. And it's also testament to open source projects like that uh, several PhDs, again, like Tom, who's not here, like he's also co-directing block research group that's Compass is his, his kind of baby. <laughs> and, and so, um, and Compass like in absorbs like several other PhDs that uh, are research and field tested and proven research and made available um, through, through, through a kind of open source platform and an easy, easy to use kind of platform. And on top of it, like, it's also like building on these geometric principles, as I said, like those are, so the structural principles for me as a designer would be rather inaccessible if it were not visual and geometric. And so I think that's also very much uh, a, so Stratus is made possible by like that 
field of kind of geometry, strength through geometry, or also representation of fabrication parameters visually and geometrically. Great, great. Chisha Jay, okay, Nolly, you're up next. Okay, I'm showing my screen now. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Um, right, I think first and foremost, I think Striatus really is uh, the coming together of some really amazing experts in their respective fields of work. Um, I think Philip has really set the next frontier in terms of applying strength through geometry and he's behind some super lightweight, high performance structures that really enables to build more with less. Um, and as you've heard from Shadjay, really putting computational design to work to augment the built experience, but, but also to revive traditional masonry techniques of the past, it's, it's quite extraordinary. And so uh, for us, it was the opportunity to work together to establish a new language for concrete, to really use concrete at its best. But what unites us all uh, beyond our passion for concrete is that we are all uh, also driven by how do we create the next frontier of sustainable construction so that we can build a world that works for everyone. Uh, we know that we're looking at um, you know, global population rise, increasing urbanization with 2.5 billion people expected to be moving to cities uh, over the next few years. 60% of that infrastructure does not exist yet today. So there's a huge building challenge, but if we want to make that happen, in a way that is inclusive uh, for everyone, we have to rethink the paradigm of how we build. That's why this promise of being able to build more with less, with what Philip said, 70% less materials, 90% less, uh, less steel, it's, it's just a whole new paradigm um, that we're all embracing together. So, um, so we're in this uh, to build a net zero future together. Wholesome um, has been leading the way in our sector to really drive the net zero agenda so that we can build this world that works with people on the planet at the forefront of green building solutions, applying smart design to build more with less, and that really is the promise of projects like Striatus, but also driving the circular economy to keep materials in use as long as possible so that we can keep on building new from the old uh, while preserving uh, nature's precious resources. Um, doing a deep dive into Striatus, I think for us, um, it's, it's an, it, first of all, it looks amazing. It looks beautiful. I think we haven't really said that yet in the call today is that there is no compromise on aesthetics here. And very often people think that when you're building something sustainable, you have to make a compromise somewhere. Well, in this case, for, this, for the anecdote, uh, we're in Venice, the city of bridges. And when the team uh, built uh, Striatus, the neighbors who basically go through this park every day uh, and I've gotten used to this amazing new structure. They want to keep it. They don't want uh, the team to disassemble it and move it somewhere else. So we're right now in discussions with the neighbors of this park to keep it in Venice, which I think is uh, in itself a testimony that you know this works. You can bring future modernistic building techniques and systems into very traditional, um, you know, amazing legacy environments, and it fits together. So I think this. This beauty um, and this functionality that's embedded in Striatus is, is really amazing. For us, um, what excites us most is that it really establishes a new language for concrete, uh, a language that's digitally driven because it's informed by this really smart design, uh, a language that's environmentally advanced because we can take 70% of concrete out of the structure without in any way or form hurting its performance, quite the contrary. It holds together through compression with no reinforcements, no binders, no glues. So it can be immediately disassembled and reassembled somewhere else, or it can be recycled immediately into a new structure. What people don't realize is that concrete is just as infinitely recyclable as glass. So with these kind of structures, we can immediately you know, re repurpose it into a new structure. So for us, uh, it summarizes uh, the next frontier of, of green construction. But uh, what's also interesting to note is that 3D concrete that enables us through smart design to reduce by up to 70% of concrete use, it can be, it's opening up a whole wealth of opportunities for us from, as we see, complex infrastructure projects like bridges, but also we're actually building taller windmills today uh, by using uh, 3D printing. So it also is a lever to accelerating the uh, renewable energy infrastructure. Uh, we can also use it for affordable housing because what the team has mentioned earlier on is that it really has this benefit of speed, efficiency, and ease of use that makes it really also uh, very interesting for affordable housing. And we were part of building the very first school in Malawi 
uh, built with 3D printing. This, the walls of the school were put up in just 18 hours. Um, it created a lot of interest from, uh, from the local, you know, the education minister, but also some other development organizations because it has the, the promise of really being a key to bridge the infrastructure gap in some parts of the world that really need it in a way that's reducing its environmental footprint. Um, so very, we see lots of opportunity in the field of, of 3D printing uh, with smart design that we see with Striatus. And I think that what Striatus is, it's not just a prototype, it really embodies some key principles that can very, today can be used and applied in, in real structures and real buildings that are part of our daily life. So it's not just a futuristic vision, it's something that's really real. Uh, the next frontier for us um, is that we want to use the most low carbon product inside. Right now, Striatus has 70% less concrete compared to a traditional structure. And if we can put our low carbon green concrete inside, we can even further reduce the CO2 footprint of the structure. We were the first to launch our global green concrete eco pact around the world last year. We're right now we're in 24 markets around the world. So from Mumbai to New York uh, to uh, Sydney, we are part of uh, enabling low carbon construction at scale. We also launched the very first global range of green cement. Um, again, making it available at scale around the world. We were the first to actually introduce a range of cement that has 20% recycled construction and demolition waste inside. So we can take an old building, grind it down and reuse it into new low carbon green building materials. And that is the future for us, applying the circular economy to take old and build new from the old in a way that's circular. Uh, and so that way we can reduce the CO2 footprint while also reducing the, the virgin material that we extract from nature. Um, all of these solutions are totally compliant with the world's latest sustainability standards from need to green. Uh, our largest uh, low carbon uh, concrete uh, pour actually took place in the US earlier this year, where we're part of this uh, Boston University new um, data campus. Uh, it's one of the science faculty buildings. We were able to take out um, 700 tons of CO2 from the construction site. So it just shows that you can reduce your CO2 footprint with low carbon materials. You can reduce it even further with smart design that reduces the amount of materials in the building. And then you can reduce it even further by making your building as circular as possible. And we're working on all these different levers to really accelerate the transition to net zero building. And uh, being part of projects like Triadis just shows that it's possible without making any compromise on aesthetics and performance. Great. Thank you, Nolik. You can unshare your screen now. Yeah. Great. Um, I wonder, if, could you tell us a little bit about the, the circularity aspect? Because I think you're right. I don't think many people do think of concrete as being kind of infinitely recyclable like, like, like glass. So with Striatus, for example, could, could you literally take uh, one of the blocks from that grind it down, um, put it back in, in, in into a um, into a kind of printable material Absolutely. and then print a new Absolutely. block from that. Totally. And so what uh, is what um, Philip was talking about, the separation of materials is really key. I think in the past, it was so complex to sort out materials that it was very cost um, intensive to recycle concrete. But if you do use, use concrete on its own as, as a pure material with no reinforcements, no binders, no glues, which is what Striatus demonstrates you can immediately grind it down and use it as a raw material for a new batch of concrete and and what uh, from from your point of view what, what what are the challenges of creating a material that can be printable you, you mentioned that striatus isn't using your greener concrete it's, it's using kind of regular concrete i imagine there was some kind of technical limitation that meant that wasn't possible what's the challenge for for making a material um printable I'll probably hand it over to my, my expert colleagues here on the line because they know more about these challenges because they're the ones who are actually working with us to shape the perfect formula. What I would say is that for this very first prototype, um, we, we used um, a, a concrete and Philip, you can go into the details on this, that is not the most advanced from a low carbon performance perspective, but we know that we can do it in a, in a lower carbon way going forward. Maybe Philip, you wanna share how we designed this formula specifically for the needs of this project? Um, well, actually, um, the formula was never shared with us. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a whole same secret. But um, I want to maybe add to what Nolik just said. Uh, what's, what's really key here, what we're demonstrating is, uh, 
is is a is a is a language for concrete where you can separate materials. I think that really uh, addresses uh, many of these circularity kind of questions. And then, with respect to the concrete use, look. look um, if you look around to 3D printing, almost everyone is 3D printing just horizontal layers, really fast, really kind of optimized construction and so on. And so uh, we needed to first demonstrate why we even need to care about more sophisticated 3D printing uh, that allows the control of non non-uniform layers so that you can start to incline them and align them to the force flow and so on. And of course, for these kind of concrete, you need a little bit more concrete magic still to be able to do that. But I, I see Striatus as an important milestone in that sense, because we set, we kind of at scale, at a, at a large enough scale, you can actually walk over it, right? We demonstrate why to care and why to actually trigger and push material scientists to not only optimize the layer at once, which are perfectly fine for walls, right? Because gravity comes down. So a horizontal layered one, an extruded one is fine, but the real bottleneck is spanning space. That is really the bottleneck in, in buildings also. The most material intensive kind of uh, element in construction are the floors, for example. And so um, what I'm trying to say with this is, is not to kind of apologize that, we, that not everything is 100% solved yet in striatus, but it's actually to say that we demonstrate why we now need to evolve our more sophisticated 3D printing inks in order to be able to have this kind of force aligned kind of uh, construction, right? And so this is, a, uh, this is a stepping stone. Already a couple of weeks after Striatus uh, got built, a colleague of mine at ETH released a paper on a, a similar concrete ink that can reduce 50% the embodied emissions, just to say that this, this is an active field, but we have to first demonstrate why we should care, why develop, development needs to go in that direction. And for us, it's a no brainer. And, and, and also because we get the geometry right, the stresses are very low. So that is yet another trigger to go lower strength and more sustainable concretes and, and so on. So, um, yeah, I yeah, don't know if that is what, what you meant, no luck, but yeah, yeah. to put on what Philip is saying is that low carbon concrete is possible today at scale. Uh, we just need more and more people like Philip and Shajay to to ask for it because it is available with no compromise on performance. Yeah. And I, I, I wonder, um, I mean, I think there, there would be some people that would say, well, it's, it's great to try to reduce the environmental impact of, of concrete, uh, but there would certainly be some people, and I know there's a lot of people at Dezine, um who, who would say that, would say, we shouldn't use concrete at all. You know, maybe we should be using wood, for example. A lot of people saying that wood is the future. What, what would you say to, 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 to people that say, you know what, concrete shouldn't have a future at all. Let's, rather than trying to make it more sustainable, let's look to something else. What, what would your response to, to that be? I would say that different horses for different courses in the sense that every material has its specific benefits and properties. If you want light, you might use glass. If you want strength, concrete is ideal. Uh, and concrete basically, it did get a lot of bad press in the 80s when it was used in a way that was extremely, uh, you know, too much material used with lots of reinforcements inside. And it, has a, and it did have a high embodied CO2 footprint. Today, we can use it in really um, you know, technology-driven ways that uses less material and in a way that is absolutely circular. So concrete, if you look at the carbon footprint of concrete, we can make it low carbon. So we reduce the CO2 footprint of the formulation of the concrete. We can make it circular to reuse it. Uh, you may have seen that in the latest IPCC report that came out over the summer, they also salute the fact that concrete is a carbon sink. What people do not realize is that concrete during its lifespan, it actually reabsorbs 25% of the CO2 that was emitted in its production process. So when you think about it, if you use concrete in the right way, which is what Striatus is, is demonstrating, uh, cities could become carbon negative because you would use low carbon concrete, you would make it the least amount of material for maximum strength, you would make it circular, and with the carbon sink effect, you'd be reabsorbing concrete from the atmosphere back into the building. Uh, and that for us, it's, it really is how you can build a net zero future. Maybe Philip, so you wanna add to that? Yeah, I saw Philippe was, was, was itching to, to no, jump in. No, it's, it's, it's just, look, um, uh, this is absolutely, absolutely the wrong message. And this is this unnuanced sustainability discourse, black and white, is, is really the problem of, 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 of today's construction, I believe. Because 
just focusing on the material itself. Wood is good, concrete is bad, is irrelevant because you need to look at how these materials are being used. Already a hint has been given. If you use materials how they want to be used, then probably you're doing much better in, all, in any material you're using. But to be a little bit more specific, right? Because if you were to look, for example, at a medium high rise and things like that, and you need to have meaningful floor spans, for example, if you were to do this in timber, then you need to go to engineered timbers, which are glue lamps. Um, let's not focus, for example, on the glues needed and things like that. But typically for those kind of structures, we don't have an end of life scenario. And actually all this theoretical absorption of, 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 of carbon uh, during their lifetime uh, would be thrown into the atmosphere if we don't have a very clear reuse case. That is why the argumentation of the recyclability and the reuse, uh, the infinite, I mean, that's maybe a, a slight exaggeration, but practically infinite nonetheless, recyclability of, of concrete, uh, that, that actually means that your materials, your components are much longer in, 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 in the cycle, right? Other aspects, so if you only focus on the material itself, then uh, a timber construction doesn't have doesn't have thermal mass. Uh, uh, thermal mass is, is so often a super effective strategy to optimize the operational energy. As an example, right, timber structures are very lightweight. So you have to often add a lot of material to solve acoustical kind of uh, challenges, again, which you would not have with a heavy material that the impact is only what you do with it, right? So if you really from the beginning design, I'm now contrasting those two, right? I'm not saying do not build in timber. If you can build in solid timber, right? Without having to actually lock in their use and geometry for end of life, then yes, then, then it's very hard to basically beat sustainably sourced timber. But at scale, at the scale, at the, at the requirement of urbanization, Bill and Melinda Gates calculated that we need to build the equivalent of one New York City every month for the next 40 years. Where are we going to find all of this sustainably in timber? Another big difference, by the way, why I get so emotional about this non-nuanced sustainability discourse is because the concrete industry, because of having been so scrutinized for already years, if not decades, they have all the data. We know everything about it. I still would like to see the data of how to plant and have a sustainably sourced timber for all this future kind of development that we need to do. And then on top of that, we need to listen to the material. You cannot build infrastructure uh, like viaducts and, 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 and roads and things like that solely in timber. You cannot provide safe, uh, safe foundations solely in timber. And, and, and. so sorry to, to actually uh, elaborate a bit, but this, exactly what you asked, Ben, is also what we want to talk about uh, through striatus, because we do need a nuanced discussion about sustainability. And that cannot happen if you only talk about that specific material. And if you don't even talk about the life cycle of a material, a component, a building. If you don't do that, then this is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Shajay, would you agree? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think what's interesting on top of all, like, I mean, I'm not a material scientist, so, like, but it concrete is indeed like, it's not like a material from yesterday, right? It's like, it's, it's part of civilization or many civilization. There's a supply chain in many countries, there's crafts and building trades built on, 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 on the use of concrete and, and, and that's also evolving. And so if you think about, um, you know, also social sustainability, like, you know, trades and, and so on, like now with digital means, like they, there's a possibility to upgrade those. Um, and even there, I think um, compared to timber, there's like widespread use of uh, availability of skill to use concrete. Um, and maybe that is because of like the modernist obsession with com concrete, but but I also think it is because it's very simple to uh, use. Like it, all you need is like to, to, to mix raw, raw material and like kind of cast. Um, whereas timber require like A, it is not available everywhere. Like, um, and, and, 
Um, and, and also the skill is even in places where there's lots of forests like Finland, like the carpentry skill is basically non-existent. So, so it's not appropriate. I think like, uh, as Philippe said, like, uh, uh, and also know like, like materials like have to, there's a social culture around materials like, and that's also should figure in the kind of sustainability arguments. And, and one of the bigger aspects of sustainability is like how long the building is relevant for, right? Like endurance is, is a, is a cost. Um, so yeah, like, so I think like there's design aspects um and the reusability of it like is, is also something for for us like a interesting discovery that we made like in, in striatus it's like oh yeah like this is actually you know it can be crushed and um which we hadn't really explicitly thought of before right then great um so going back to to striatus so obviously this is kind of it's proving a, a concept um what do you think are, are the kind of the, the, the real world applications of this or, or how could this kind of technology scale up to be applicable so that we could, we could use it a, a across a, a city to have a real kind of impact on, on, on the kind of things that you're talking about? You go I don't know who wants to that? go for that? Uh, it feels like I'm talking too much, but obviously I have answers to all of these questions uh, because otherwise, why are we doing it? No, uh, no so the, the, first, the first one actually, Ben, is... It, you, it's really remarkable how many emails I've already gotten of real projects where they're now thinking, can we not do this as an as a like striatus as a 3D printed bridge, right? And and arch bridges from the past, I mean, they easily go up to 100 meter spans, right? There is actually fundamentally no reason that we cannot do this, right? But rather than doing it, locking in the materials, and, and, and as we said before, it could really follow these principles of, of, uh, of uh, masonry again. But uh, more importantly, actually, is uh, we are in parallel. We are also developing. Uh, that's why I gave the examples uh, of a floor plate. So we are developing floor plates that use exactly the same concepts. And we all need floor plates. In fact, there's an estimate, uh, an estimate that in the next uh, three decades, we uh, will be building 300 billion square meters uh, of floor area. Uh, that is another calculation of this one New York City every month and so on. So, um, and, and really the floors spanning space is the bottleneck, right? Also in timber, also in steel. And there, because they're lightweight structures, uh, there the bottleneck is acoustics, right? And so we're, we're demonstrating exactly the same principles so the benefits of reducing the volume, the benefits of being able to use very low strength or so low pollution materials, the benefits of dry assembly so that it's fully demountable and so on, the benefits of clean separation of materials so that you can really uh, um, uh, uh, kind of recycle it easily, the benefits again of, of, of making something robust that can adapt to, to, to future use and things like that. So, um, it all sounds maybe very abstract, but what's exciting is that uh, also, again, with Holzim, uh, this idea that just got built in a project in Zurich that probably will uh, hit the press. Well, not probably, it will hit, hit the news in three weeks from now. We actually built one of those floors uh, in a real project for the first time. So this is a key milestone. And now we have decided, let's take this to scale. And let's give ourselves a couple of years to use all these very pure principles to attack the most banal element that we all need in construction, the real bottleneck in construction that is the floor plate. And so that is how we translate it. And to me, that's actually super exciting that all this sophistication and elegance, structural geometries and so on will be hidden inside the structure where no one uh, needs to see it. So I think that's even more powerful, by the way. Yeah, as Philip said, we look forward to announcing this new uh, project very soon. Uh, but basically, it takes all the principles of striatus, of strength through geometry, minimal material use for maximum strength, lightweight, high performance, and it applies it to floor, floorings, uh, which is something that, as Philip said, is going to be broadly in need when you look at this urbanization trend that we're facing. The beauty of the concrete that we applied for this particular project is that it is low carbon and it has a very high circularity rate already within that concrete. So we're really taking all those principles that we described, low carbon materials, smart design, and circularity, and they are all embedded 
in this, um, in this application for these flooring systems. The beauty also of such lightweight flooring systems with cavities inside is that you can embed other intelligent uh, features into the, the floor system, like for instance, geothermal heating systems, which even makes the building smarter using the flooring space that was before not used, you can all of a sudden embed new functionalities in that flooring system. So it's opening up a whole world of opportunities. And, and is it, I mean, in order, I suppose, for uh, kind of mass adoption, I guess we also need, it needs to be um, commercially viable. Like, is, is it competitive with other solutions out there? Can, can 3D printed structures be done affordably? Philippe's putting his thumb up. <laughs> now, look, I mean, if, again, otherwise, why would, do, why would we do it, right? But uh, so, by the way, there's different 3D printing. You can 3D print the, the, the material directly. You can also uh, use uh, fully recyclable 3D printed molds. So there we're still seeing which one and which stages are kind of uh, are, are, are best to be uh, followed. But um, yeah, I mean, the uh, ridiculous amount of material savings already gives you a niche, right? And now, as I mentioned all the way in the beginning, digital fabrication is really scaling up to robustly being able to produce now uh, these sophisticated geometries. So if you set that up right, and currently we are rather, go, rather going for the fully recyclable uh, plastic molds to cast in a more traditional way concrete uh, elements, uh, because it's a low hanging fruit. And that 100% is, is competitive, even with optimized standardized uh, elements. And I only know this because we're lucky to be now involved in, in, in a real project for uh, for a 150 meter tower, I cannot disclose where and with whom, but uh, these kind of projects are really forcing us to address all the relevant questions. There is no hiding. Uh, so, um, and, and just Tom and I and, and, and Shaje also, I know it in his role, we don't want to be academics. We don't just want to fly around the world and giving lectures and being inspirational. The key point today is to have impact and to translate some of those. And so you can only do this when you challenge yourself in real projects. Again, that is why we do things like striatus, because it really challenged us. And it's also still not perfect. I mean, there is a few flaws and we learned a lot. And, and, and it, but if we don't stick our neck out, no one is going to. And so I see it our responsibility to kind of really push these things forward because the potential is there. Great, thanks, Philippe. And Shaja, from from the kind of more technological kind of perspective, um, obviously for this project, you had to build your own software. Um, like in term, from terms of like software side, what needs to happen for, for this to become mainstream? Uh, does like a, a big um, kind of player in the BIM world need to to, to look at your code and, and produce something that you know could be used across architecture practices across um, industries? Yeah, I think it like is the opposite. Like it's the knowledge that needs is being disseminated, and like the next generation of designers are like fully capable of like assimilating the learnings and and like kind of running with it, right? And that it's it's no longer the case where like architects have to wait for like some software company to make tools for them, like. Uh, and um, and and so we we are also realizing this in other areas like that like it's better to build like tools of collaboration and tools that allow you to uh, you know co collaborate and co-author like and kind of really revisit the process which you know maybe in the 20th century because of various reasons there was a clear separation. Uh, between design and, and engineering and construction, maybe partially for legal reasons or liability reasons, but like all of that is being turned on its head because the computer has become a medium of collaboration and 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 like as we mentioned, like geometry and visual means of or visualizing these like really helping um, the next generation and like of designers like to collaborate. And I think so. That's that's what's really uh, promoting all of the uh, um, in uptake basically like it's like and also like the concrete printing technology is relatively robust and doesn't need it can work just as well like in uh, in India or in Africa or in in Mexico or like and all of these places 
um, like there have been inquiries like and they're really curious uh, why because there is this all of the uh, material needed is there and the robot is not that expensive right like uh, compared to like other materials that need like heavy investment in uh, machinery like all you need is a robot and a pump kind of right like so so there is that um, aspect which will also I think make it very mainstream like in the near future and there's that's perhaps why there's so much 3D printing uh, or so much interest and activity in 3D concrete printing right that like in the last decade like there may be about 80 or 90 suppliers of, of the technology and and uh, in when it's in the decade before there were three and then the decade before that there were none so um, so it's really catching on and like I think digital tools and demonstrators like are, are very, very important in that. So like now, like there will be interest in other architectural practices and like particularly on, on the, in the smaller startup kind of practices to really uh, make use of this technology and build something in, in Thailand or like, and we are seeing, seeing inquiries almost on a daily basis on, you know, how to do that. Yeah. Yeah, right. building on Shaja's point about the affordability point, um, I think as I mentioned earlier on, we built the first uh, 3D printed school in Malawi. We know that 1.6 billion people today lack adequate housing, and that number is likely going to double if we don't tackle it uh, by 2050. And we see a great opportunity for 3D printing to play a key role in that affordable infrastructure gap. Great. Um, we're almost out of time, but we do have a, a few questions from people watching uh, at home. Um, so um, uh, one question has come in. Uh, will buildings take on a different aesthetic uh, if 3D printing becomes uh, more widespread? I mean, I guess for you, maybe you, you talked about this about hiding in the buildings, but I guess that kind of goes to, to the question I asked you at the start um, about the, the, the kind of aesthetics of, of, of striatus. Do you think this technology will le is, is leading or will lead to a kind of new aesthetic in our cities, or is it going to be very much like structural behind the scenes? I mean, we, we would definitely want it to, to be expressive, right? Like, you know, as one of the things that we, we genuinely believe in at Zadi Architects is that like beauty is a promise of performance and, and um, yeah, so it should be visible. And, and, and if, if, if that aesthetic is not high performance, then we should get rid of that. Uh, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't be attracted to that, right? And, and so that, so in that sense, yeah, we definitely want uh, like these express these structures and buildings to express uh, the aesthetics uh, aesthetics to come from the way it is made and the way it stands up. Uh, you know, so it's, yeah. <laughs> well, from anyone uh, knowing some of our projects, which uh, have been mainly indeed on the pavilion scale, I guess, but that is uh, rapidly changing. It's clear that we like to express how something was built, that you're honest about and that you don't add things uh, at other layers. So in that sense, I agree with, with Shaji, but I also um, don't want necessarily uh, improvements, uh, particularly when it comes to new benchmarks for sustainability targets, not to be pushed forward because they're being associated with a certain style or aesthetic. So that is why I made that comment that I also think there is there is something to be said uh, of just uh, just the structural kind of aspects to it because if we if if an innovation um, uh, demands from everyone to also adopt a very a particular kind of uh, language then I think we might be missing a lot of the impact that we're after. But, uh, but that said again, I mean, I do think that there is a natural beauty and elegance in actually showing how something was made and actually not trying to hide that. So um, I, I have a bit both hat, hats. I, I, I don't want to miss the boat. I, we have bigger challenges. We need to really provide good new solutions. Cool. Yeah, I think what Sriyadis uh, does do is it shows that assisted build construction can actually be beautiful because it is a beautiful piece. Yeah, definitely. Um, and one other question, which is from UH Studio, um, which is um, asking about like what are the next steps for um, adopting this 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 process, 
And maybe I'll, I'll open, open that up a bit wider as well, because Nolly, in your presentation or, or just afterwards, you kind of mentioned quite a, a tantalizing thought, um, which was the idea of you know a concrete city or you know using concrete in a city that can be actually carbon negative in future. Um, I guess to, to broaden that question out um, to, to all three of you, um, what do you think needs to happen for us to to, to get there? How, how do we how how does that um, carbon negative a city um, using concrete, um, how does that become a reality over the coming decades? And let the designers go first. Um, yeah, I guess Philippe has to first let me graduate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, needs to I think like, you know, like these and then demonstrators are like problems. particularly key, like it's every, at, uh, like every year, like it, it does um, like engage, like I, I know I've been banging on a little bit more uh, about the next generation, but like they, these are the visible things that are uh, like make, make uh, you know, younger people aspire to uh, come into the profession. And, and, and that's, that's also a demonstrate uh, aspect of the demonstration here is that you know, the AEC industry can be computational, it can be digital, it can be scientific, it can be exciting and not necessarily uh, lose the, uh, you know, philosophical or the aesthetic or the, or the, or any of the other social aspects, etc. right? So it's, so it's not, um, yeah, it's not binary, like it, like the, it, you can, you can have your cake and eat it too, kind of. <laughs> So the, the future is is in the hands of uh, of, of students uh, uh, who are currently, uh, yeah, looking at this project with a lot of interest and thinking, what are they going to do next with it? Yeah, yeah we totally believe. Yeah, sorry, today we totally believe that when used right, the way they do the three others, uh, carbon uh, concrete can totally be carbon negative. But also, a, a neat part about the concrete that we develop is that they also enable more nature to live in cities. We were, for instance, we were part of the very first vertical forest that was a building called El Bosco Verticale in Milan that basically has trees uh, throughout the entire facade of the building. Uh, we also have um, a permeable concrete called hydromedia where water can flow through it. So the, basically the, uh, the plants can get nourishment. Um, we basically built forests and parking lots and that helps us counter the heat island effect in cities. Uh, there is a, a parking lot in Paris where by putting the trees in this in the in the parking lot with this permeable concrete, we reduce the temperature by six degrees in that particular space. So it really key it plays a key role in um, in keeping making cities more livable. So I think there is a huge opportunity to use concrete at its best, like Striatus does. Cool. And Philippe, what what do you want to see um, in in the coming years? What 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 would you like um, from a kind of even just a professional point of view? Like where do you want to see the industry headed? Yeah, um, actually, for that, I want to maybe, I mean, obviously, to start to really take this pressure and this res uh, on the climate and the responsibility that we have an, an, as an industry uh, more seriously, right? And so that's, that's maybe the first thing that I would like to say. I mean, particularly the UK, in fact, is leading the way. We are continuously looking at what's happening in the UK, the ice truck T and, 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 and the regulations that are being put. So, I mean you're on the right track but um, in general I wanted to maybe uh, take your question to highlight one thing that is so impossibly abstract and intangible about striatus and it's really uh, Shaji brought it up it's this co-authorship and this working together and collaborating in different ways so I see uh, computational design digital fabrication as a discipline where you really have to collaborate uh, from the beginning. Otherwise these things don't make sense. Then they're just expensive add-ons and so on. And so the question of, 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 of really indeed and questioning the relation between people, how, uh, um, how much uh, different people are being paid, um, also authorship. And, and, and so that was particularly interesting and challenging also again for this project because it's not our first rodeo is to try to find all media to clarify that this is not Zaha that invented all of this, but that it really is a collaboration by many people. And, 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 and 
And that is actually uh, something that I think will be essential for the future, because uh, only by bringing all these expertises together from the beginning, you can set a new stage, you can disrupt. If they follow in a sequential way, then you're basically always too late with your expert knowledge. You're, you're, you're just solving things too late. And so to me, that is almost, that is again, sorry, many layers as Shadja said, striatus, right? Um, but that is, that is such an important aspect that we try to demonstrate here. And we did this in such a co coherent kind of way. And in that sense, Shadja already mentioned through Compass, we're still kind of cleaning everything up and so on, but we will share our process. We will show how this was done so that the younger community of more technically oriented, computationally driven kind of designers can learn from how we approach this and then make it their own and extend it and, and do with it what they need to do, right? And so um, I, I hope that our future is significantly more collaborative and not, not just romantically collaborative, but really to the core with, with, with really the right tools to actually talk about maybe a digital master builder, not just one genius person, but actually a collective of people that come together to make this virtual digital master builder that really builds like, like they could build with real constraints in the past, right? Because we have real constraints. I mean, it's our one planet. And, and so I hope, I hope that we, we intrigue at least, or also maybe inspire a little bit by how we have approached this project and where a big famous architecture firm like Zayadit Architects is insisting even that this is a co-design. And, and to me, that is also a different mindset. And as long as we cannot get over that, then we will not be making significant differences to how we build. Right. Well, that sounds like a, a suitable note to, to end the talk. Um, thank you, Philippe. Uh, thank you, Sajay. Thank you, uh, uh, Nolik. And um, before we go, um, you mentioned the bridges in Venice. It, it's still there, right? So people can go to, to see it if they, if they want to. Yep, in it's November. there until the 20th of, uh, of November. Yes, so great. You can go so visit it. If you're in Venice, um, go to, to check it out. Um, thank you to all our panelists. Um, thank you to everyone watching at home. And um, yeah, uh, see you on the next one. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thanks, Thanks ben. everybody. Cheers, guys. Bye. Cool, we're off air.